Good evening. Welcome to APTN National News. I'm Dennis Ward. Parliament kicked off today with Liberal MP Anthony Rhoda, elected Speaker of the House of Commons. Hours later, the throne speech set out the Trudeau Liberal priorities as a minority government. Jamie Pashigumskum reports from the Senate in Ottawa. The Governor General of Canada, Julie Payette, arrived to the Senate to a 21-gun salute to deliver the throne speech of Canada's 43rd Parliament. Natan Obed, President of the Inuit Tamarit Kanatami, David Chartrand, President of the Métis, and other chiefs and MPs waited inside. Now this throne speech comes just a day after Justice Minister David Lametti said that he wanted to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People by the end of the year 2020. And indeed, this was the first item on the list of Indigenous goals in this throne speech. Other goals were that they wanted to work towards eliminating all long-term drinking water advisories on reserve. They want to ensure that Indigenous people have access to high quality and culturally relevant health care and mental health services. They want to work to continue to implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action and the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls calls for justice. They want to close the infrastructure gap by 2030 and they want to ensure that Indigenous people are in control of their own destiny and making decisions about their communities. They said they want to take steps to ensure the government is living up to the spirit and intent of treaties and agreements and they want to ensure that Indigenous people who were harmed under the discriminatory child welfare system are compensated in a way that is both fair and timely. And they also said they wanted to continue to invest in Indigenous priorities. It's interesting to note that this Liberal government throne speech had considerably more Indigenous focus goals than in 2015. In fact, there was a whole section entitled Walking the Road to Reconciliation. Here's what this government had to say about that road. Reconciliation with Indigenous people remain a core priority for this government, and it will continue to move forward as a partner on the journey of reconciliation. Indeed, when Indigenous people experience better outcomes, all Canadians benefit. In the throne speech, the government said the road to reconciliation is long, but they will continue to walk it with First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. Jamie Pashagumskum, APTN National News, Ottawa. Still in Ottawa, three days of meetings have come to a close. The Assembly of First Nations Special Assembly saw chiefs calling on Justin Trudeau's minority government to live up to a number of promises. National Chief Perry Bellegarde outlined some of those asks in his closing remarks. ...of the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. We look for a call to action and implementation on the National Action Plan for the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. We stood together for Grassy Narrows, for justice, for the cleanup of mercury contamination. We also said we look at justice and finding ways to look at dealing with restorative justice, not punitive justice. And we also looked at ways to deal with the CHRT tribunal decision. And we've said clearly we will not stop fighting for our children. It's been one week since the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples became law in B.C. Our Tina House spoke with some of the residents in that province about UNDRIP and what it means for them. This is where Gary and I stay. Yesterday has been living in Oppenheimer Park on and off for the last 18 years. This is where we sleep. This is where our, our friends sleep. And anybody else, if they have nowhere to go, they're very welcome here. There is no question that despite all being homeless here in Oppenheimer Park on Vancouver's downtown east side, this is a community that takes care of one another. She says she's very hopeful that with the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, now law in BC, the Indigenous people living here in Tent City will finally have their human rights respected. It's about time that somebody actually, hey, these people do exist. I just hope it gets better, you know, because not everybody wants to be here willingly. Like, I would like a home, you know. I would like my own fridge and stove, you know. 
So I hope this gets better. Nicole Whitford has cerebral palsy. She depends on her guide dog to help her, but otherwise lives an independent life. She has a degree in archaeology and currently works for the government in HR. She's worked hard for the life she has, and she has an opinion on UNDRIP. People with disabilities, you know, we're always fighting for accessibility rights, um, um, access to services. And so I think with this legislation, it'll help bring that to the forefront and ha make our voices heard. She's originally from the Gitsan Nation, but now lives in Vancouver. And like many others, she wishes she knew more about her culture. She's hoping UNDRIP will help change that. I think it brings a connection um, for people who might not be on reserve, but they're part of the community to be a part of something, you know, to have that connection with culture and identity. And as the work plan for UNDRIP gets developed with the BC government and Indigenous leaders, it's these voices that might just make the difference now that their human rights are enshrined into law. I hope my opinion matters to people. Like, I hope people listen, you know? That's all I ask, you know? And but we'll survive. We're survivors. Tina House, APTN National News, Vancouver. And we'd like to hear what you think about the UNDRIP bill being passed in BC or any other story. Here's how to continue the conversation. Send your emails to news at aptn.ca. Find us online at aptnnews.ca and on youtube.com slash aptnnews. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for the latest Indigenous news. A Métis assistant professor at the University of Alberta has won an award for, help, for her work helping to develop a program for teen mothers. Melissa Tremblay has spent the past four years helping to develop a program to give the mothers the best chance for success. APTN's Chris Stewart talked to Dr. Tremblay about the Successful Families program. Melissa Tremblay recently completed her doctorate in educational psychology. As part of her dissertation, she has spent the past four years working to help teen mothers get a helping hand. Tremblay wrote her PhD on the Successful Families program. This program was co-developed by the Brentwood Development Community Group who offer affordable housing for families and the Terra Center who support young families. My role was to first use uh, what's called a developmental evaluation approach to assist the organizations in developing the program model and also to evaluate the impacts of the model. Melissa would meet with staff and the young mothers. She would offer best practices for the moms and find ways for the program to improve. They started implementing different screening measures for parents to enter the program so that they were being set up even more for success. She says that being there in person to talk to both staff and the teens created a bond that helped everyone. When you are engaged with participants and organizations over a number of years, it's inevitable that you are going to form those relationships and that can actually um, lead to richer and, and um, more in-depth findings because you've established that trust and, and people are willing to share their stories. Stories like yes. Alexandria Carlson. Um, she was a teen mother who says the Successful Families program gave her a big boost. I think this, the program has played a big role in getting to me where I am today. Um, I think I, I, it has taught me a lot. I've learned a lot about how to be independent and how to be a better mother. And I don't think I'd be a bad mother without it, but I do think that it has really pushed me that extra few steps forward in getting to, getting to where I need to be and allowing me to make mistakes along the way while having support. Tremblay recently won the MyTax Award for Outstanding Innovation in the Indigenous category for her work. MyTax is a nonprofit research firm. They partially funded Tremblay's research. Alexandria is hoping the Successful Families program will expand. I hope that it grows. I hope this becomes something that's 
um, that's widespread across, you know, Alberta and Canada, and that more, more and more people have access to, um, especially young, young parents, moms or dads. I really feel like it is very crucial to getting them to the right point and getting them, getting them off the right foot when they're just becoming young parents. Chris Stewart, APTN National News, Edmonton. Coming up, we continue our perspective series on the impact of climate change on youth in the Northwest Territories. But first, as you've been hearing, it's been a busy week in Ottawa, and that must mean it's a packed show tonight on Nation to Nation. I'm Todd Lamoran, and here's what's coming up on Nation to Nation. As you can see, we're here at the AFN Special Chiefs Assembly. On day one, the new Minister of Indigenous Services addressed those gathered. And I spoke to Minister Mark Miller about the rollout of the new child welfare legislation and the Human Rights Tribunal's compensation order that the government wants reviewed. As well, Cindy Blackstock of the Caring Society and Manitoba Regional Chief Kevin Hart both dropped by to tell us what the new minister should do. That's coming up right after the national news. Here's a look at Friday's weather forecast starting on the east coast. Minus one and sunny for Fredericton, plus one in Halifax with snow. Snow and minus six for Nain, minus one in Cartwright with snow. Snow and minus three in Montreal, more snow and six below for Shibugamu. A rain snow mix for Toronto with a high of zero. Similar temperature in Ottawa, minus three. Sunny and minus 8 in Thunder Bay, rain and 10 below for Sioux Lookout. 21 below with snow for Churchill, minus 10 in Norway House and God's Lake. Snow in Winnipeg and minus 7, minus 3 in sunny skies for Dauphin. Sunny and minus 4 in Swift Current and Regina, minus 6 for Yorkton. 7 below for Meadow Lake, minus 11 under sunny skies in Buffalo Narrows. Welcome back. For people in the north, traditional foods hold much more than nutritional value. In the fourth part of our Youth Climate Change Perspective series, our reporter Charlotte Morton Jacobs hears the concerns over food sovereignty. In a land of plenty, food options for northerners is limited. Indigenous diets are changing fast. Like, it's really like disheartening to see like the effects of it because like as like the river it's like really low so you can't really fish or set a net because the food that we have available to us is really expensive uh, so it's either buy the expensive food or drive an hour and a half drive to Whitehorse to get food. In this old hockey rink a buffet of crops grow for the people of the Beaufort Delta. Youth are here to tour Inuvik's community greenhouse. Well, this garden is actually a good learning opportunity because it'd be nice to see a garden like this in my hometown. Because we do have a greenhouse, but it's not as this big and it's not used to feed families. In the territories, a few corporations control the food market. And many say the federal subsidy program does not serve the people. We rely on the ice roads, and sometimes they're not able to come up here because the roads get closed. But so, like, sometimes we don't have, like, eggs or milk or, like, vegetables. But for the youth, the idea of food security goes well beyond the nutritional value and purchasing power at supermarkets. In the north, country foods is tied to survival and identity. For you personally, like what does it feel like for you when you get out on the land? Everything melts away. Mariah McDonald says she does not have access to the same foods as her ancestors did in the Yukon. I remember when I was six, uh, up in Klukshu, uh, the river was just red with sockeye salmon and now whenever I go back up to Klukshu, um, around that sort of salmon time where they sort of mate, there's not really that much fish. Last time I seen fish, I think I only seen one or two just swimming around. And what's the reason behind that? I'm not too sure. No one's really told me like 
where they might have went or what their natural migration pattern was before. I don't yeah. really know who to ask because most of the elders have passed or are passing. A Donda Canadian also <laughs> sees changes in the Dato region of the Northwest Territories. <laughs> Like, for instance, I grew up eating duck and, like, rabbit and loose meat. And as, like, the years went by, the food on my plate became pork and beef, which is not something that, well, my people, like, we don't have those up here, so we never really ate it. The custom of food sharing from harvest is becoming a challenge. Original, like, I guess, like, hunting places, you can't go there anymore because of, like, how fast the ice is melting. Like, this past spring, my father... Um, he went to go hunting, and like usually you would go, you would go by skidoo to get to the place, but then he couldn't even go by skidoo because like the water just went, it went really fast, like the ice went really fast. Global warming greatly impacts ice and snow. Southern Canada may not feel the same food insecurities as the North right now. But with 80% of fresh water derived from snow in the Arctic and subarctic of Canada, it won't be long before fresh water for all food production will be compromised. Yeah, because you can't eat money. We need food, we need water, we need land more than we need money. We need oxygen more than we need money. Money isn't going to save us. It's paper, it's plastic here, which is worse <laughs> than paper. Um, but. We only have one Earth, really. Um, yeah, there's some planets that look like Earth, but they're like light years away and it'll take forever to get to. So right now, this is our only option. They've learned a lot over the last few days. Now it's time to apply it. And the target audience uh, I, want, I want to affect is the youth and leadership. Tomorrow, youth map out how they will bring knowledge and get more community members interested in the fight against climate change. Game. Charlotte Moore Jacobs, APTN National News, Anubik. 17 year old Mariah Pachawis from Mistawasis Nehiawak in Saskatchewan is on her way to the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Spain. That's because she wrote an essay on the subject. APTN's Priscilla Wolf has that story. I'm looking forward to is meeting the other people that are um, also going around from around the world. And I'm also looking forward to seeing um, this um, event that I'm going to and seeing all the big um, uh, environmental activist people. And I'm very excited to meet them. Mariah Pachalis is referring to the United Nations climate change meeting in Madrid, Spain. World leaders and decision makers from around the world will be in attendance. And because of an essay writing contest, 17-year-old Mariah Pachawas, a high school student from the Mistawasis Nehiwa community, will also be attending. Her teacher and chaperone, Denise Desjardins, says Pachawas will be a part of a group of youth from around the globe. Mariah is part of a group with um, youth from around 28 countries from the world. So we're meeting as a collaborative group, which we then... Um, They've been working on this process for about four months already. However, we've only came in maybe about a month ago, so it's a lot of catch up for Mariah right now. Um, however, we will we'll meet as a group, continue to write a paper, which will then be presented um, to the UN leaders. Dejardin says having Pachawas take part in a climate change conference at this level helps get the message out to other Indigenous youth and give them a voice. I think, um, yeah, I think that's a great opportunity to get our Indigenous youth involved in a, a huge awareness of climate change because climate change affects us like everywhere around the world and having our voice in it is a huge, um, I guess be like a huge honor, I guess, for our Indigenous youth. But Chalice is staying in a dorm with seven other girls. It will give her a chance to make friends and share stories about where she lives. Her trip was made possible by family and community fundraising. My cook um, she, um, she did a fundraiser for me. Uh, we had a bingo, and my other my grandpa helped with it, like both of my grandparents. A lot of people helped and donated a lot of stuff. Pachalis is grateful her family and the community of Mr. Wasis Nihiawak is supporting her on this journey. It makes me feel very happy and that knowing that um, whatever I want to do in life, that my family and community will support me. 
because this is something I want to get more into. Pachawas and Desjardins will return after taking in a week of the UN Climate Change Conference. Priscilla Wolf, APC National News, Saskatoon. Glad to see she took the taco toque with her. An all-new episode of APTN Investigates will debut right here tomorrow night after the news. We've got a preview for you after the break. Here's the rest of Friday's weather forecast picking back up in northern Alberta. Sunny and minus 9 for Grand Prairie and Fort McMurray. Minus 3 for Calgary, Edmonton and Medicine Hat. Zero in Lethbridge. Rain and 9 above for Victoria. Partly cloudy and 8 for Vancouver. Sunny and minus 16 in Fort Nelson. Plus 3 under sunny skies for Prince Rupert. 36 below for Old Crow. Minus 35 in Dawson. 19 below with rain snow mix for Fort Liard and Trout Lake. Minus 24 for Saks Harbor. 30 below with snow for Fort McPherson. Minus 33 in Baker Lake. 35 below in Whale Cove. Minus 29 in Arctic Bay. 23 below in Clyde River. Welcome back. The Supreme Court of Canada upheld Mi'kmaq treaty rights in the 1999 Marshall decision. Trina Roach takes a look at the impact of that historic win and the status of treaty rights 20 years later. Living Treaties Part 1 airs tomorrow on AP10 Investigates. Here's a preview. It's like a way of my life. Like I feel free when I'm on the water. I feel really good. I feel really strong. Marilyn Lee Francis is Mi'kmaq. She's been fishing off the southwest tip of Nova Scotia since she was 14 years old. You don't got to measure him. For the last four years, she's been fishing lobster with no tags, no license, outside of the rules set by DFO, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. I just get tired of being a prisoner of the, of the Canadian government. Marilyn Lee is asserting her inherent right to resources. Okay. It gives me great pride to say that I fish like my ancestors did. At the center of the case, this man. 20 years ago, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld treaty rights in the Marshall decision. What followed? Conflict. Success. Frustration with DFO and the Canadian government. You can't put a dollar figure on our, on our rights, on our treaties. I believe that they're in, in violation of their own, their own Supreme Court. You need to, to honor the relationship, and you're not. You are not. Looks good. We'll speak with Trina about it here tomorrow. That's your AP10 National News for this Thursday. For much more, visit our website, aptnnews.ca, and never miss a story by downloading the APTN News app. Stick around. Todd Lamarand is up next with a busy edition of Nation to Nation. I'm Dennis Ward. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you back here tomorrow.